Hi hey everyone. Um, so I, my name is Brendan. Um, I did my PhD here at Scripps um, and I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Liverpool. And today I'm going to talk to you about basically give an advert for two methods that you can use to reanalyze uh, measurement data that are in magic or in your own format and you can convert. Um, and yeah, just kind of also give an advert for putting data into magic so they can be reanalyzed. So um, I've got two methods with funny acronyms that I'm gonna show you today. So there's one called BICEP, which stands for Bias Corrected Estimation of Paleo Intensity. And the other one's called TROUT, which is stands for Thermal Resolution of Unblocking Temperatures. So that's the structure of this talk. So sort of the, the motivation behind this, at least behind the BICEP method um, is the sort of state of selection criteria in paleo intensity data. So the way that pale intensity data are analyzed is inconsistent between different labs. You have different selection criteria used and different methods. So this plot is a plot from uh, Cromwell's 2015 paper where he was looking at uh, Hawaiian lava flows. And these are loads of data for the Hawaii 1960 flow sorted by study. And you can see that depending on the method used, uh, and on the selection criteria used, you get sort of a range of values which are about the range of field strengths on Earth today, um, which is, you know, not, not a great state of things. And I don't mean to show this to disparage any particular method, because I think people have got better. But the point here is that if you're, you know, taking old paleo intensity data sets with no measurement data, and then trying to compare them, you can get vastly different results just for the same lava flow. So it's key that we need measurement level data to be able to compare paleo intensity results. So in terms of selection criteria, uh, I, I found it very, very frustrating uh, working with them because they sort of represent the quality of paleo intensity data, but they're just this binary pass fail thing. And you might want a different quality of your data, depending on what you're working on. So if you're working on RQ intensity, you might want quite a precise paleo intensity that you can fit to a curve. Whereas if you're working on sort of proterozoic stuff, you might want to know what order of magnitude the field was at. And so some people go for a grading approach. So you give things an A, B, or C grade, and then you sort them into those groups. But there should be some sort of weighting system where higher quality estimates should sort of have more weight on your estimate than lower quality ones. And that's that's how I always felt. Um, so the idea that I came to was that non-ideal pale intensities that we're selecting out, we're selecting out because they're biased. And what I mean by biased is some systematic deviation that isn't just random noise um, from the true value that you want to get. And selection criteria are indicative of this. And so perhaps you could model bias as a function of selection criteria. So th this is sort of the, the fundamental idea that I started on with. And so there's one selection criterion, which I think is particularly important, which is the curvature criterion that Greg Patterson came up with in 2011. So the idea behind this is that you fit a circle to your RI plot, scale data on your RI plot. And these are some data from Crasser, where he took some powders, uh, magnetite powders of different grain sizes and performed paleo intensity experiments on them after giving them a, a, a TRM in a 60 microtesla lab field, excuse me. And as the curvature value on here increases, the actual total TRM uh, intensity, which you can kind of see from the um, x axis here, it, it gets um, sort of gets longer here. So the, ac the aspect ratio of these things is changing. Um, the intensity that you get out of it gets weaker. So there's progressive bias that occurs as you go to higher curvatures. Um, and so I thought, what if you fit, um, you know, a function to this? If you try and look at a correlation between curvature and bias of your pale intensity. So something that's a straight line, you get a pretty accurate pale intensity, 59.3 versus 60, and something that's really curved, you're getting a big underestimate. Um, so that's that's what I did with the bicep method. So 
uh, again, BICEP stands for Bias Corrected Estimation of Pale Intensity. And so the sort of fundamental equation of BICEP here is that your true ancient field is equal to your observed field, you can see the cursor here, uh, at your, uh, from your specimen, uh, plus some line slope times the curvature. So it's just a linear fit between bias and curvature. And then this is just a, a noise constant. Um, and so if you plot up curvature on the x-axis for different specimens against uh, the intensity on the y-axis, you see that um, specimens which have low curvatures, this is, this is zero, um, give values that are close to the true value at this site represented by a red line. So this is a historical lava flow that Cromwell measured in his 2015 paper. And so we know what the field was, and it's close to the zero curvature data. And then things that have high curvature are sort of biased low. These error bars on here are also part of the bicep fit. So this is a result from the bicep model. And how this works is that you do these circle fits. And if you have something that's a straight line, your circle has a really large radius and you're very, very zoomed in. So it looks like a straight line on this scale. And you get something with a you know small error bar that's close to the origin. Um, if you perform a circle fit to something that's a circle, you see something that's more curved and therefore has higher curvature. Um, and that plots down here because it has a lower overall intensity and it has um, you know, a higher curvature. So it plots further to the right. And then if you just sort of throw complete nonsense at this, so if you, you try and use this specimen for some reason, I'm not sure why you would, basically you get these enormous error bars. So it, it doesn't do anything to your fit. Um, and so, you know, even, even if you put something that's kind of rubbish like there in there, it's not really doing anything compared to the specimens. So this is sort of a nice weighting system that we can use to measure paleo intensities without actually excluding specimens from our, our analysis. Um, and so, oh, yeah, and so when you just, just to sort of go over this, right, just when you get the estimate, uh, the way that you do this is you're looking at the intercept. So the zero crossing point, the correction back to the uh zero curvature point so basically all of these lines are different fits to this equation um using a bayesian method so this is kind of giving you the uncertainty and then this is the distribution the posterior distribution or samples from the posterior distribution of those zero crossings of those lines and so you get something that is centered right around the actual value so you get an answer of sort of 34 to 36 or 37 point something um so there's some advantages for this to this. So a big advantage is that you have this weighting scheme. So these low curvature specimens, even if you don't have a very well constrained line slope or you don't seem to have a relationship where the sort of linear relationship is particularly well constrained, these are still going to have a lot more weight because they're close to the origin. And you effectively, if you just have things that have zero curvature, um, you'll have really unconstrained line slope, but you'll have very well constrained or origin or sorry, intercept rather. Um, and also these uncertainties in curvature and fields also weight the specimens. And so a uh, sort of good way of explaining this is, you know, sometimes people use the FRAC criterion or some criterion to uh, constrain the length of the line on the RI plot or on the Zydevel plot. Um, because if you do have something that's not a straight line, and then you observe it over a very small range of temperatures, you might, it might appear to be a straight line with those few data points. So the way that BICEP accounts for this is it's kind of fitting to the whole RI plot space, but um, it also, if you choose a range of temperatures, which is smaller than the whole RI plot space, it still tries to find what that curvature is. And that translates to a larger uncertainty in the curvature, which you can see here. And so this kind of enables you to weight your specimens as a replacement for those sorts of criterions. Um, so there are some disadvantages. So this is uh, something where you have uh, a few specimens with very, very small curvature. Um, so these are three specimens, which I think most people would consider to be quite good individual estimates of paleo intensity. Um, but if you have a small number and they have a very small spread in their paleo intensity, so a small range of curve, sorry, small spread in their curvature rather, um, you end up with a line fit that doesn't really go anywhere. And so effectively, you, you know, these are all the line fits that are just in random directions and you end up with a huge uncertainty, right? 
Um, and then the other, the other sort of disadvantage is I sort of mentioned that you can choose your temperatures on your RI plot, but BICEP actually doesn't provide a way for you to choose those temperatures. So that's something that has to be user defined. Um, and so that's sort of the, the current state. And then I guess the, the final disadvantage, although empirically, uh, this seems to work quite well. So that the results that you get from this method are, are very accurate when we've tested it on things with uh, historical lava flows or things given TRMs in the lab. Um, the issue that you have um, is that perhaps it doesn't seem very convincing that you would have a linear relationship between curvature and bias. So um, that's something that for my postdoc, I'm, I'm trying to investigate if there's a physical meaning using micromagnetics between this relationship between curvature and bias. But this entire relationship is, is phenomenological um, at the moment. Um, so stay tuned. So there's some current applications of this. Um, so something that I've been working on recently that's in prep, uh, it's just been submitted, um, is a comparison of some pale intensities that I uh, collected in Hawaii, which are in green here, to some pale intensities from Israel and some pale intensities from Antarctica, which are in uh, orange and purple, respectively. And these are studies that were all performed at Scripps. Uh, I reanalyzed the other two studies using uh, the BICEP method entirely, and they're all targeting similar lithologies. And so the idea here is that the, time, the temporal average of the pale intensities that you get over the last 5 million years should be the same at all of these sites. Um, but it's not, and clearly this is not a function of lithology or the analytical method used because these are all, you know, done in an identical way. Uh, I'm not going to get into why they could be different right now, but this is a good example of where you can use reanalysis to say uh, what the source of these differences could be. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, something that's being used to test the GAD hypothesis over the, the past four or five million years. Um, so back to that problem of choosing temperatures for the RI plot, um, I think uh, I've listed a, a set of conditions that you want for a good uh, set of temperatures to choose for your RI plot. So because BICEP takes care of everything about the interpretation that you've chosen in terms of weighting it, um, what you really want now is a magnetization that's univectoral, trending to the origin, and where there's no thermochemical alteration. Um, and so these are sort of three things that you desire. And this is an example of something where doing this isn't that hard, right? You've got, um, you know, a, a univector, quite clear univectoral magnetization trend into the origin. You, you could probably everyone would place it on this 200 degree um, temperature. Um, fun fact, this is actually a specimen which in this Hawaii data set uh, failed the Cromwell criteria of 2015, and that's because it doesn't have a large enough frac parameter. And again, handily, BICEP says, well, there's not very much uncertainty in curvature that comes from excluding these two points. So it's kind of a useful uh, way of showing how that binary pass fail can exclude things that you don't really want to. Um, so to choose temperatures on the R plot, that's a simple case, but you may have cases like this where the temperature that you might choose is less easy to constrain. So people, I think, get far more curved Zydeveld plots than this one. But if you're trying to interpret, you know, you have two different uh, magnetizations acquired in two different fields, there's quite a range of temperature over which that could have occurred, right? So I'm, I'm looking at this and I, you could pick something up to maybe 425 here. Or you could be very conservative and say, you know, I only want a characteristic component of your magnetization that's below sort of 510, 520. Um, and there's different reasons for this. So if you have a non-ideal pale intensity or carriers where the sort of blocking temperature distributions of your two components overlap, perhaps because there's some lack of reciprocity uh, in the grains that hold your magnetization, you can get behavior like this. This particular sample is a scoria sample, and so I, I think that probably what happened here is that the specimen moved while cooling, so there's sort of a rotation of this cluster as it cools down. And so the curve in either of those cases is going to represent some mixture between two endpoint directions. Um, this is, again, not a 
so I, I know that Justin yesterday had a sort of poster on something slightly similar to this idea of unmixing endpoint directions. Um, but that's in cases where you might have two populations of grains, and this is sort of targeting where you might have two TRMs or two magnetizations of the same kind, which overlap for some other reason. Um, so there's a video. I'm not going to play that just yet, actually. So sort of to, to unmix these components, um, you can sort of model a uh, demagnetization experiment. And the way that you can do this is you can you have three things that you want to model. You have a direction of each component, you have a magnitude of each component, and you have an unblocking temperature distribution for each component. And this can be done with uh, coercivity, you know, AF demagnetization or microwave demagnetization. It's the same principle. It would just be a coercivity spectrum or a microwave power spectrum, right? So I'm going to show a video and hopefully, ah, okay, that's fine. I can uh, probably, just uh, if I get out of this, I can probably get to this movie. So this is a PDF slide deck, so not easiest to link this. So the idea here is that this this plot here on the right is going to draw a Zydervold plot uh, as you sweep through the temperatures in a demagnetize in a thermal demagnetization experiment, um, and the the population of grains which are in a, uh, that were magnetized in a particular field are represented in blue and red here. So at 300 degrees, the direction of the magnetization is going to change because those grains above that temperature were magnetized in a different field. And then, you know, you've got a reheating to 375 degrees here. So this is the case that you have all single domain grains and everything's reciprocal. So when you plot this out, um, you get a uh, Zydervold plot, which has very, very straight, very, very straight lines, and it is easy to resolve the components. Um, if you have two unblocking temperature distributions, which overlap in this way, then you get something that's a curved Zydervold plot. And this point where the two distributions cross over one another is going to be the point at which you have sort of the corner of that Zydervold plot. So that's going to be the point of maximum curvature. Um, so I have a non-animation way of showing this as well. So if I go back to this, um, so this is this is just again your parameters that you're constraining. So C here is a um, not the same C that's in bicep, but it's a magnitude of each component. Um, this F of T is the unblocking temperature distribution of each component, and then these B hats are field directions. So they're field vectors, unit vectors. So Basically, the idea here, again, is that if you have two straight lines modeled here, you have basically no overlap between these two unblocking temperature distributions. And if you have a curved Zydervold plot, you'll have some overlap between these unblocking temperature distributions. And you don't need a particularly large amount to get a fairly significant amount of curvature um, between these two distributions. So that's that's sort of the, the forward model of what I'm calling trout. So, um, we can then take the inverse of this, so we can fit this model to existing Zydervelde data, um, and we do this by maximizing the likelihood in a, in a Bayesian framework, so we take the closest fitting data, and then we have some priors, and the main constraint on the prior here is that when you're unmixing these two components, you try and find, uh, you have a preference for distributions which are less overlapping. And the reason for this is that you can imagine in sort of the extreme case where you have two antipodal components, you basically can't tell what the overlap between those is at all because there's no curve, right? And so um, I don't actually have an example of that shown here, but so you want to constrain it to be the minimum overlap that you can get away with from your data. And so this is that example with that... Um, uh, basically with this model fit here. Uh, this is the unblocking temperature distribution you get out. And then the colors plotted in here are like an interpolated version of the model. So it's evaluated at a lot more temperatures. And the color here represents the ratio of these two unblocking temperature distributions. So where they, where they sort of cross over, that will be a white color where the blue is dominant. So where that component is dominant. 
you get a blue color on this plot. And where the red is dominant, um, you get a red color on this plot. And so darker colors represent uh, more of that component is unblocking than the other component effectively. And so you can use this by looking at the crossover point and the range of the overlap to isolate regions where you've just got one component unblocking or to isolate the temperature to which something was reheated. Um, so we have some empirical experiments. So these were for Sarah Maher's thesis where you've got three, so Sarah Maher was a student here at Scripps, uh, three component magnetizations, uh, PTRMs, that were given to these rocks along the X, Y, and Z directions um, in the lab. And you can see that for this one, there's not really any overlap between your components. So you get something that effectively just approximates a continuous blocking temperature distribution with very, very little overlap between these components. And then for this one, the what, it, what is that? That's, I think, the z direction in this case um so this is kind of downwards there's sort of a curve in the direction between this component and this component and so in the unblocking temperature distribution you get an overlap between these two components and so this can be used to constrain quite a few things so i just uh, have a few applications here so one that i talked about is isolating single components for intensity and directional estimation one could be determining cooling rates for slow cooling bodies if there's um, reversals recorded in those. Um, one could be for emplacement temperatures of pyroclastic deposits, as I discussed with that um, uh, scoria where it came to rest. And a final one could be bait contact tests for igneous dikes. Um, these last two, uh, so this is, this is again submitted work that's just been submitted a few weeks ago. Um, these last two I'd have liked to have some examples for in the paper, but uh, I really struggled to find these in magic. Uh, I had a, I know I had a talk with uh, Nick Swanson Heisel yesterday about this, and there are some data, some bait contact test data in magic, but because that's not something that you would necessarily sell your paper on, it's not described in the abstract or in the title necessarily, and it's not in the method code. So we discussed maybe doing a Google Scholar search and then getting the Deweys and then putting those into magic in some programmatic way. But I think this highlights the need for available measurement data in magic to do these kind of reanalysis studies, because it would have been really nice if these were sort of easily findable within magic. And perhaps that's something that we could think about as a community in terms of searching, you know, uh, perhaps having method codes for these sorts of things or, you know, something that that would make it easier to find these things. Um, so that's sort of uh, those, a very quick overview of those two methods. Uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Uh, I've got a couple of slides on future work and where you can find these methods. So um, one thing that I sort of want to um, add to the BICEP result is, is this is sort of unsatisfactory to me. I think we can do better than this. And one way that we can do this is to have a, a prior in this Bayesian model on the line slope. And the reason for that is because if we look at the absolute magnitude of these curvatures, they're quite small. They're much smaller than that 0.164 cutoff that people say gives you an accurate paleo intensity. And so you could put some prior in here looking at existing data about that relationship between bias and curvature and look at sort of what the maximum you could be expected to get was and put a prior on that line slope. And then you'd have a more well-constrained paleo intensity when you have fewer data. If you have lots of data, this isn't an issue and it, it won't change your result. But if you have sort of three or so specimens, it will. And um, basically uh, you need about five or six specimens. Not all of those have to be good. Not all of those would have to pass under other criteria, but you need five or six specimens roughly to get an estimate with BICEP. Another thing I want to do is add support for microwave telier. This is just a, a programming issue, but it, it's something that's going to go in there. Um, and a notebook that is more programmatic. So currently we have a, a GUI notebook that you can use um, that I'll give a link to on the next slide. Um, but I also want something that is, if you know some Python, you can actually produce these plots more easily. It's, it's not actually hard to do. I just need documentation for it. Um, and then finally, eventually, I want to come up with something that's sort of a combined approach with both of these. So obviously, Trout kind of feeds into Bicep by allowing you to pick 
uh, temperature ranges for your uh, intensity data, but it would be nice to have an approach that considers the full vector and takes into account unblocking temperature distributions, kind of like we've got some forward models that Andy Biggin and Greg Passon have been working on. It'd be kind of interesting to invert something like that. So with that, I just want to give you a set of locations that you can find the Bicef and Trout code in. Um, and feel free to, if you have any problems or if it, you feel that the documentation's not enough, feel free to shoot me an email and ask me for help with installing, help for getting this running. I'm happy to, to, to do this. Uh, you can also use Bicef on the Jupyter Hub, um, but I wouldn't always recommend it because the Jupyter Hub has to allocate memory across instances to different people from one server. And so it can be a bit slower. However, if you do that, the, the install is much simpler. So there's, there's a trade-off there. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just a short overview and feel free to ask me any questions that you might have. Um, three comments first, really nice presentation. Um, it, it would have been interesting to see the 1960s data mm -hmm. analyzed by your method, because mm -hmm. then you could if you can get those yeah, so so I, I sh maybe should have put them on the presentation. Those are in um, the so so those are actually in the paper. There's actually two studies on the 1960 flow 60s flow that was used in the test data set for Bicep. Um, one of them gives an accurate answer, and the other one doesn't. Right, and I think that the authors. I think it's a I think it's a Tanaka paper that uh, I might be wrong about that actually. I, I can't remember who the authors are in the, in the second one, but they suggested that the reason that those Tellier results are high in the second paper is because there's a TCRM, right? So it's it's not a TRM, but uh, so that obviously like the 1960s flow is a little bit of an odd one to show on that. It's maybe a bit of an extreme case, right? I think a lot of people know that there's problems with the 1960 flow, but yeah, that it was done in Bicep and we do get an accurate result from the Cromwell data on the 1960 flow. The yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then the, the third thing was when you're trying to determine what the uncertainties are, mm -hmm. have you found out bootstrapping? So you say you must always have your core values, but otherwise pop out uh, several values and average and then work your way through not only finding what the best solution is, but finding things that are going to push the outlier and then identify them and say these are always outliers and they're going to be the best. Yeah, so, so. <sighs> So the bootstrapping approach is kind of it's sim. They say some similarities. So um, the way that the Bayesian method works is that it will always give you smaller uncertainties as you increase the number of data, right? So if you there was some some work that we did in the paper where we subsampled these and we sort of looked at um, if you just take a subset of your data and you want to predict whether you're going to get a decent result if you have five or so, uh, and you want to predict whether you have a decent, you'll have a decent result by measuring more, or whether you should just give up. There's sort of a methodology defined in there for that. Um, in terms of identifying outliers, um, there. So, so if Bicep really, really struggles to uh, find a model that that fits the data. Um, it often won't converge. So it, it, the way that this method works is it runs four Markov chains in parallel. And then if, they can, if they're convergent, there's some diagnostic that it spits out at the end that tells you whether they've converged or not. And it can identify particular specimens that are causing it not to converge because it, every, param every specimen has a set of parameters in the model and there's a convergence statistic for each one of those parameters. So it can be used in a way to do that. Um, and there's that's kind of talked about in the paper as well. Yeah. So. Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. This was a wonderful talk. I mean, then sort of both of your topics here uh, relate to this question, which is a, I think a real challenge in dealing with kind of intensity on rocks that have a more protracted and complicated history, including several own fronts. Mm -hmm. um, it is that need to sort of choose temperatures, as you saw, but in the paradigm, you sort of highlighted, but then in doing so, lose the ability to evaluate that. Curvature, right? 
Yeah. And and you have a real bias for human endeavor to show it's a low, low error intensities because you're not able to evaluate whether you're at uh, lower, lower slope. All right. So I guess I'm just curious about how you are thinking about that. Do you sort of say, hey, we could prune down to those, but then you're losing that information by yeah. by stepping uh, mm. or actually just acknowledging that uh, and incorporating that in here. So so I, I think that there's potentially a way of doing this because this is something I've thought about, right? If you have a very small proportion of your magnetization, you lose that curvature information. But also then it would just mean that you wouldn't be able to do anything that's past a certain age with this, right? And that's that's a problem. Um, a right, I guess past a certain thermal... But, well, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, plus a certain thermal history, but that, yeah, it's going to be really tied to age, right? You're, it's going to be really difficult to do proterozoic stuff with this. Um, I think that the way that you could get at this is if you have a way of separating out each of your components, uh, and again, this, this probably would be served better by a, a full vector method, but you could look at correcting each of those to be on a consistent, um, scale with that so basically you you take you do like calculate a paleo intensity for each part right and then you correct them all back to some common paleo intensity and you look at whether that's linear um over the whole set uh i don't know how well that would work because i think there's still it's still going to look linear over small scales but it probably won't be correlated at all with where your components change necessarily, I, I'll have to think about that some more. But there's definitely something I've been I've been considering, right? That that this is going to be difficult if you really want to use a very very small subset of your data on the RI plot. But then again, I think if you just get a lot more data, you can still get good uncertainties. And then actually, you know, it's just an uncertainty increase that this offers, right, from the curvature. So. Um, depending on how precisely you want to know the answer, it may not be as much of an issue, right? It's just providing a framework for that uncertainty. So uh, it, it would be interesting to test and, and work out how many specimens you need if you have, you know, like 30% of your magnetization vector. Um, yeah. <laughs> Was there another question? Um, one thing that I think would be interesting is if you combine the two you know, I can see for meteorites, you might have two magnetization directions and two different paleo intensity schemes, mm -hmm. right? And that might be an interesting to play with too. Yep. And you call it bicep. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, there is, again, in the bicep paper that we did do this on uh, some, I think, archaeological data that were. Mm -hmm. They were fired in a kiln and then they were reheated in an oven somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so you've got two different directions in there. And there again, you can you can isolate one of the directions quite well. The other one wasn't so easy, but that was because there were very few data points for the secondary component. Um, but yeah, one of the directions with sorry, this is with bicep, you can you can get an intensity for quite quite well. Yeah. Uh is there another question? Yeah. Okay. So, so in the context of this method, uh, uh, it seems like at least for now, I, I want some coverage that you have. Um. So, so it, yeah. This this depends, right? Um. So having a variance in the curvature is often better, but um, if you have enough data, uh, this becomes less of an issue. Uh, one of the problems with it is in constraining this line, if if you have stuff that's on both sides of the zero line, right, then it's fine because you're crossing it and it can't work out what the relationship is, but it's constraining it to basically the centroid of your data on this plot. That's always going to be the most well-constrained point. Um, if you have data that are all like one-sided in curvature, but it's small, that's that's when you end up getting a problem. And I think this can be solved by having like a slightly more well-constrained prior on the line slope. Um, Cause I, and actually I've looked into this. Um, so I looked at the test data set that we used in the bicep paper. And it's, if you look at the relationship between bias and curvature and the sort of distribution of it, it's almost exactly like Cauchy distributed. So, which you kind of might expect because it's a ratio thing. So you can definitely, you know, uh, take one of those distributions and use that as a prior 
And I think that's what I, I might end up doing. And then basically that will say, okay, you know, if you've got a uh, 0.05 curvature, you're probably not going to be more than like 10 microtesla off unless there's some other thing that you don't know about that's going on, like it being not a TRM or something like that. So that that's kind of where I want to go with this in the future. Yeah. Just push, push a little update to it that uses a, a prior on the line slope. Yeah. So, so currently the, the reason that it really doesn't perform well for these, uh, like curvature slope things is that the prior on, uh, like the, the C parameter. So in this equation, right, this is, this is the line slope and the prior on this is completely unbounded, right? So the line can literally be like vertical. Um, but if you have any number of data, so because I, you know, I didn't want to sort of a priori say anything about what that relationship could be, because it's not, you know, a, a thing that we have a physical explanation for it's phenomenological. I think that that's maybe a bit unreasonable and you could constrain it a bit better for when you have a few data. So that's kind of the idea. So there's, there's basically no assumption on that, except that there is a linear relationship. That's the only assumption that goes in there. Um, and if, you know, we, we get some physical model for what curvature is, and we find that it's actually not a linear relationship, it's something that appears sort of pseudo linear, but it actually has some other thing we can, we can update this. But, um, I did try in the paper using like other types of relationships. I use other polynomial fits to this. And basically if you get more complicated, your, you know, you get more parameters and your precision just gets much, much worse. So a linear is kind of giving it enough degrees of freedom, but not too many. Um, and it does look quite linear in some cases, right? Like in this case, it's, it's a pretty linear relationship. And there's, there's some sites in that paper where it's like extremely <laughs> linear and it's very strange. Um, and in some cases it's not so linear. Uh, yeah. So that, that's the only assumption that goes in there. So that's a long answer to your question. You have a, a question about trout? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes, that is correct. Uh, no, no. So you can, you can, I mean, I guess if you're doing programmatically, um, you could do that. The the tricky thing about number of component stuff is that the like everything is unconstrained basically in this problem, right? The directions are unconstrained, the blocking temperature distributions are unconstrained, and also, you know, like yeah, the magnitudes are unconstrained. Everything's unconstrained, and so the other thing that's unconstrained is the noise, right? So so I have like a noise model, but it's it's not set uh, at a particular value. Um, and so the difficult thing there is that most, most kind of choice, discrete choices in a Bayesian framework, this, this is a, a complicated answer again, but, but most ways of performing choices are based on information criteria or like Bayes factors, which are very, very dependent on your priors. And actually they're extremely de dependent on what your priors for your noise distribution are. And so um, say you have something that doesn't fit the data very well, but is like a single component, you fit a single component to this, it's not gonna fit the data very well. But if you say that your noise is very, very large, under your framework, that's fine, right? Your model is acceptable if your noise is very, very big. So it's tricky to, get a kind of a, a discrete choice under this framework of number of components. Um, and any single method that you use, another method may give you a, a different answer. If it's, if it's very um, easy like this, right? If it's, it's easy to understand that there's two components in here. If you have something where it's more tricky, um, any particular method, like a different information criteria, base factors will give you extremely different results between each of them and also depending on what your prior is so i think there's something that's like fun I, i've thought a lot about this problem actually this is something that i was really hoping to be able to get in here but i think there's something fundamentally uncertain about some of these cases that isn't going to be answered by it'll be consistent depending on whatever method you use but it's not going to be um just answerable by doing kind of a inverse prop inverse theory approach it's gonna still 
still be uncertain whether you do it or whether uh, a machine does it. A machine just might be more consistent. So yeah, again, long answer to that question, but yeah. 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 So that so 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 yeah, so this this is an interesting question, right? Ultimately, in this case, because the red component is so dominant over the blue component at this temperature, it's not going to contaminate much. But there are cases where it it you know that that will be more significant. Um, so I think that yes, this is where I would be going with this full vector approach idea. The question is that you then have a third distribution, which is your blocking temperature distribution of your PTRM, and you have to propagate everything depending on the steps in your full vector approach, because that's how you get like zigzagging in your direction and stuff like that. So it's, it's a much more tricky problem to solve because um, you've got this potential contamination of your PTRM. It's, it's not impossible. It's just going to take a very long time to make something like that. So yeah, absolutely, you you can separate. And actually, you the the directions are effectively separating that out, right? That contribution, so that the end members of of being chosen uh, based on that. Um, yeah. So so the directions, you know, there shouldn't be contamination in those directions. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you.